Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the RSA. I'm Rachel Holmes, a, a writer and historian, and it's my very great pleasure to welcome you all here today for this special lunchtime talk. Uh, I'm going to particularly welcome those who've braved the snow uh, and beasts from the east and who knows what from the west to get here. Uh, but before we begin, uh, as well as asking you to please turn off your mobile phones, I'd, uh, I'd like to welcome those of you who are joining us online. We're live streaming over the web today, so a very big welcome to you. And a reminder that the hashtag, that the hashtag is hashtag RSA women. So please do join the discussion on Twitter. So that's hashtag RSA women. It's my very great delight and pleasure uh, to welcome today's speaker, Shami Chakrabarti, uh, on the occasion, very lucky for all of us to be here, uh, of the publication of the paperback of her second book of women in the 21st century. And for those of you who've already read it, and those of you who will find out when you do if you haven't, uh, it's, uh, it, it gives us clues and more, a pathway to the 21st century and beyond. And that will touch on some of the issues uh, that we look forward to hearing from Shami about today. Her first book on liberty, also published by Penguin, was written while she was the director of the National Council, so, uh, the National <coughs> Council for Civil Liberties. And uh, her second book of women has been written while she's now doing a different job, which, as you all know, is of the, as the shadow attorney general uh, for the Labour Party and also sitting in the House of Lords for the Labour Party. She joins us today uh, to discuss her latest book on women. And it gives me great pleasure, and please will you join me in a warm welcome to Baroness Shami Chakrabarti. Thank you very much, Rachel, and, uh, and another huge thank you to all of you who did brave the blizzard and, and the cold weather and, and so on. I hope that this will be uh, the kind of environment where people will feel comfortable to cough um, and not have that, and, and not fear a Theresa May moment, or I think we should just all cough together and, 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 and do this with complete uh, relaxation and impunity. And if you do it, then I'll feel, I'll feel comfortable about uh, doing it too. The RSA is a very special venue for me. I've been here a number of times in different contexts over the years. In particular, I was remembering just now in the green room, being here, I think about this time of year, but in slightly more temperate weather, in 2011 with the late great Tom Bingham who launched his own paperback, uh, The Rule of Law, here at that time. And um, it was an absolute joy to, to, and, and privilege to, to chair the launch of, of his books, book. He had written so many eminent judgments by that point. He was probably the greatest jurist of my lifetime. But he asked me as if it was a huge favor if I would chair his paperback launch. And he was, um, he was recently retired from um, the highest court in the land and he was looking forward to being liberated from the impartiality of the judiciary and in particular he wanted to campaign for the Human Rights Act um, and for those progressive values. Um, sadly we lost him only months after that event but I shall never forget the, the students who clutched his paperback um, people from all walks of life, not just lawyers by any means. And, um, and so it's nice to remember him today. And, and also more recently, I had the privilege of chairing uh, Glenn Greenwald and David Miranda, who you'll remember had had a very tough time uh, uh, being detained under the Terrorism Act and had sworn they would never come back to, um, to Britain after that experience. And yet they came for a conversation with perhaps some of you and with me here I think just months ago at the RSA. So this is, you know, when it works, this, is, um, this can be a very, very special place of debate and discussion and conversation and also with, with people watching at home. So let's do our best to do that again. Um, Rachel asked me if I might set up our discussion with a short reading from the, um, the introduction to, um, to, um, to the book. There's a slight amendment to the, um, 
to the paperback version, which, as you've heard, is out today. The, the um, hardback was, was published in October. You may, you may, um, you may guess what the slight amendment is. Um, I'll, I'll leave it to you to work out what, is, what has been added between, um, between uh, last summer, when this was originally written, and, uh, and a few weeks ago. So this is, this, is how, um, this is how it goes. Imagine a Martian falls to Earth tonight. Let's say Martians are sexless and completely unaccustomed to sexual or gender-based difference on their own planet. Our alien friend could arrive absolutely anywhere in our world, on any continent, in a rich, poor, urban or rural environment. What difference, discrimination or oppression would they notice everywhere and most of all? Surely they couldn't fail to observe that roughly half the race is overtly diminished in a way that diminishes the other half in a manner that's perhaps more subtle, but nonetheless real. Look at the suicide rates of young men in particular. Look at them all over the world, in and out of war, crime and incarceration. Look at your kind, clever and gentle sons, brothers, husbands and lovers, and the pressures that can make them become the closed and invulnerable bullies who first bullied them. Wasted potential, lost happiness, wasted life. I don't want to call the glass half empty, but the pace of its filling is certainly too slow. Twenty years ago, I thought we were in inevitable positive transition. Fresh from the comfort and confidence of a completely free and relatively egalitarian state higher education, I had all the time in the world and I thought I wouldn't need it. Now I'm not so sure at least in the short term. I had so much faith in my generation of similarly educated young men and women who shared classes, books and dreams, but grew up to betray each other and themselves with crunched credit, illegal wars and a more unequal world of our own making. What would a Pankhurst or de Beauvoir make of my generation of feminists? No doubt there would be some cause for celebration, but the festivities would surely be muted. Women vote, fight, and own property and power in many parts of the world. But whether by hook or by crook, an unbowed misogynist took the keys to the White House from a woman who once seemed a near inevitable first female leader of the free world. And within just a year, of the election of President Trump came revelations of the multi-decade Harvey Weinstein sexual abuse scandal, with its own shockwaves through liberal Hollywood and the much wider world. As woman after woman emerged with allegations of historic abuses of power, all denied by the producer, ranging from cringeworthy inappropriate advances up to and including rape, the film star Tom Hanks described the phenomenon as a watershed moment, a sea change. He says, his last name will become a noun and a verb. It will become an identifying moniker for a state of being for which there was a before and an after. Prophecy or hyperbole? Only time will tell. Sure enough, the scandal inspired a raft of painful testimony from past victims of abuse, much under the hashtag MeToo. This went well beyond the entertainment industry and even crossed the Atlantic from the infamous casting couch to the corridors of British political power. Yet if Hanks before was a world of fearful silence by victims and complicity by the colleagues of the mighty, the only satisfactory after would involve a new atmosphere in every aspect of life. More open and equal cultures would leave power more accountable and engender trust in due process to deal with abuses in the moment instead of years later in the media with its inevitable imperfections. In the meantime, and in so many places, women still learn, earn, influence and govern less and suffer more whether from the petty but dehumanising indignities of casual objectification, and physical, uh, casual objectification and discrimination, or from the emotional, sexual and physical violence 
that dulls and even snuffs out so many of their lives too soon. Gender injustice may be the greatest human rights abuse on the planet. It blights first and developing worlds, rich and poor women, in the context of health, wealth, education, representation, opportunity and security everywhere. It is no exaggeration to describe it as an apartheid, but not limited to one country or historical period. For this ancient and continuing wrong is millennial in duration and global in reach. Only radical solutions can even scratch its surface. However, the prize is a great one because of the collateral benefits to peace, prosperity, sustainability, and general human happiness. All this because we are all interconnected and all men are of women too. Thanks for listening. Shami, thank you very, very much uh, for, for that reading, uh, which, which, as you say, <clears throat> sets the context and uh, beautifully introduces us uh, to, to some further thoughts um, on this book. Why, why this book and why now? Why this book and why now? Um, I, you know, I'd love to say that I had the crystal ball a couple of years ago and predicted this great um, tumult um, in the world, and but that's, not, that's not quite true. Why this book for me, and why now for me, I think, is a combination of factors, some of them personal, some of them professional, um, some of them political. I think from a personal perspective, um, you know, I'm seriously middle-aged these days and um, with all the you know with all the you know the yin and the yang that comes with that and I think that I'm I guess when you're nearly 50 you're a little more impatient for change you're not prepared to wait for this sort of gradualist approach that will achieve I don't know pay equality in 500 years or you know equal representation in the supreme court in 50 years or whatever some people have said you um you you look back on your life, all, 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 all the positives, but also you, you, you feel, as I indicated in the introduction, mm. that perhaps your own generation hasn't done quite enough. And I think that's a lot, particularly when I compare my generation with, for example, my mother's. So that's the sort of personal aspect. And then from a pro professional point of view, I was at a moment when I was no longer required to be cross-party and non-party mm. in my public comments and analysis, and I think that was really important because I think that um, feminism is not a, a, a non-partisan, apolitical, civil liberties issue. Don't, don't get me wrong, I think that civil liberties are um, extraordinarily important and they were my, my entree into public life and I will hold them and defend them always and, and dearly. But I don't think you can look at gender injustice without also looking at cultural, social, and economic rights. And that means this is politics. It is not a niche, you know, this is not something that all Democrats surely, it doesn't always seem that way, but all Democrats <laughs> surely should agree that torture is wrong, that free speech is good, fair trials, so on and so forth. But all Democrats are not going to agree about, um, and they just don't agree, about the state of economic inequality on this planet, about the fact that eight men, and they are men, own more of the wealth than the 3.6 billion poorest people on the planet. And I don't think you can write a feminist intervention without addressing that kind of structural, entrenched economic inequality. So, so, that, so, so my, my, my professional move and my politics mm motivated this book and I think made it possible for, for me to do so. Why now? Well, I think it's an extraordinary moment uh, politically, not just in Britain and Europe, but on the planet. In many ways, I, I appreciate it's quite a terrifying moment, um, a moment of polarization, a moment of desperate insecurity, a moment of extraordinary inequality, greater than when I was young. But with that comes, I think, um, an opportunity and a responsibility, I'm afraid, to pick sides and, 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 get, and, and get stuck in. And I think, as I say, ultimately, 
um, gender injustice is part of a wider and increasing social injustice on the planet, unless all of us, women and men, do something about mm. it. And thus liberated uh, from, from the burden um, and constraint of impartiality and neutrality. Uh, tell us uh, about the approach, something about the approach that you've taken to the subject of women. What, what's the structure of the book and, and what are the themes that you've chosen? Well, because I'm an internationalist and because I think the world is shrinking and interconnected, um, I, th I thought it was important to attempt, at least, to look at this from a global perspective. Um, very ambitious in a way, but I think incredibly important. You know, if on the one hand you only look at the lot of uh, gender injustice close to home, you know, here in London or England or the United Kingdom, I think you would be, you know, safely and correctly open to the challenge that, well, it's so much worse in, you know, name your favourite other place, Saudi Arabia or, or whatever. But equally, if you, um, if you have the audacity to comment on the lot, and, and I do, the, you know, the lot of women really still struggling in parts of the world for basic reproductive rights, for, you know, for basic rights to go out in public and work and so on, um, if, you don't, if you don't take a look in the mirror at your own society and your own community and gender injustice um, here, then I think that you're open to the charge of, of, of hypocrisy and, and, and so on. And so, um, so I attempted to look at this globally. So that meant that I, if you're not going to carve up the world um, geographically, mm. I try to, to, to carve, look at life in, in, in various different aspects. So I looked at this question, um, I looked at this question first sort of a little philosophically. And there's a, there's a chapter at the beginning called Prayer Before Birth, where on the one hand I look at some of the debates that you've probably read about and participated in about what it is to be a woman you know, that, you know that, that whole philosophical debate that's been quite heated in politics recently. Indeed. But also I looked, at, um, I looked at the still troubling numbers on gender selection, either in ter uh, whether, it's, um, whether it's in terms of uh, people you know, choosing mm. the sex of their babies when they go through IVF and so on, which is still really quite troubling from a feminist perspective, but also um, um, gender selection and... Uh, abortion and so on. Anyway, that, that's, that's perhaps the most philosophical chapter. And then the structure of the book is, is, as I say, different aspects of life. Wealth and production, health and reproduction, incredibly important. Home. And home, for me, is a chapter that's about, on the one hand, family life and, and, and all that goes with that, but also physical shelter, which is, you know, such a desperate problem for so many, for so many women in the world, including close to home. Um, and then also at, um, at school or education um, and uh, security or insecurity as it is for so many women um, in, in their homes and in their intimate lives as well as on the battlefield and so on. And then ultimately faith, which will often, whatever the faith, whatever you know, the religious institution or tradition sometimes rub up, against our 21st century ideals about, um, about equality and gender equality in particular. And then ultimately a conclusion with an attempt to summarise some of the things we might do. Mm. And <clears throat> going back to that, um, <clears throat> I mean, you, you talked about the, uh, the way that you go in philosophically, <clears throat> which is a, a, a really broad and helpful setup because you're literally looking at this question of you know, what, what constitutes... A woman. What what is the subject of your subject? Um, following that, you have a chapter mis misrepresentation, and there, as elsewhere in so many places in the book, it just has this kind of great sense of you just get us right in there. That's one of the things I really like. You're just right in there at the top, and effectively, as I understand it, that 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 chapter is it's really about politics and the media. And I mean, we have every you know we have everything from Trump to Brexit. Um, Yes, no, thank you for reminding me. Yeah, there's a, there's a chapter called Misrepresentation, which is essentially a look from a you know, 21st century feminist perspective at the state of our media, including new media and politics. And I have to tell you that um, you know, I'm not a great consumer or a participant on, um, on social media. I, don't, I basically don't do it. <laughs> but when you look 
Uh, and on the one hand, I, th I try to suggest that it's a, it's, it's, it has great potential. It can be a great democratizing thing, and we can, you know, um, campaigns can spread. You know, look at Stormzy's fantastic um, mobilization around Grenfell the other week, you know, without needing the help of, of press barons and, 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 and so on. That's the, you know, t to my mind, that is the most benign and, and, and more than benign, positively exciting, dem democratizing. Um, facet of, of new media, but goodness me, from a feminist perspective, there's a dark side too. And reading some of the treatment, for example, for example, of my dear friend and colleague Diane Abbott, was really very, very disturbing in, in, indeed. Um, and 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 and, and, of, and of other and of other women, political women. Um, um, and, and then, of course, that whole issue of if, if you're like Diane and you're a political woman, you're of the left, you're a black woman, and you've been, you know, this prominent voice in British politics for 30 years, goodness me, you are wearing the dark board, you know, virtually on your head. Um, and, and social media is in danger of being the sort of Wild West, um, ungoverned space where anything goes. And, and just trying to, and I don't think I've got answers to that, but I'm just trying to open up our thinking into why that is and what we, what we might um, do about it without shutting down, you know, this, this, this wonderful, potentially exciting space. And then in terms of political representation, mm. I think it is worth comparing the, uh, the legislatures of different states mm. around the, the planet and the ones with better representation, more, you know, more gender balanced representation. Um, and frankly, looking at the fact that, that quotas do seem to make an incredibly positive difference. And even in terms of, um, you know, British politics, you'll forgive me for now being partisan, but even if I weren't partisan, just pointing out that the Labour Party currently has more women in the House of Commons than all the other parties combined. Now, is it because everybody is just so amazingly progressive and the men are all just standing back? Well, maybe, but maybe all women shortlists have something to do with that too. And you've seen that kind of approach working very, very positively in, 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 in other legislatures as well. And I think that's, that's, you know, that's, that's worth looking at mm. because it clearly... Um, you know, we want, we want greater gender equality in all aspects of life, but having, um, having better political representation isn't the, isn't the, the whole answer, but, it's, mm. but it certainly helps. Um, <clears throat> I'm conscious that we're sitting here on, on, on the centenary of uh, the representation of the People Act, mm. uh, which of course has a broader application than, than just to some women. I mean, it's actually, you know, to, to, to men um, and, and, and the most broad suffrage to date. And perhaps we can come back to that. But before we do, you, you were saying about taking, looking at, at, at structural approaches mm -hmm. and developing on your expertise and, and long experience, both as a lawyer in the Home Office and, and then at Liberty, working with civil liberties. Um, one, of the, one of the areas uh, that, that really interested me uh, was your introduction and, and analysis of, of feminist economics. What is feminist economics? Well, this is, you know, I think you know, there are people better qualified than me. I mean, one of the great things about this for me is that um, it allowed me, this exercise allowed me to um, venture into new territory for me, to read about things like health and read, uh, uh, read about the science of, uh, uh, of gender and all these assumptions that are made about how different we, we, we really are and are, are they exaggerated differences or, and so on. And, and, and to read about people who've been banging away at, at trying to establish, if you like, some kind of feminomics for hundreds of years, since the 1890s, really, with someone like Charlotte Perkins Gilman and so on. And I would say, for, as a, from a lay perspective, that maybe feminist economics is just looking at women's work and contribution as if it counts, right? Looking mm. at women's work, including in the home, including um, unpaid, not just low paid, but completely unpaid work that for, for the most part has not been recognized as economic activity at all. You know, not been counted as part of the GDP of nations, not being valued. 
Um, and so it just becomes something that holds people, holds women back in paid employment because they're rushing home for childcare or increasingly care, care for, um, for sick relatives or older relatives and so on. It's just something that gets in the way of them not you know, achieving the giddy heights of paid work rather than something that is valuable to, to society, without which society would not mm. sustain, without which, the economy. Yeah, without which you wouldn't have your next generation of good little workers, soldiers and reproducers of the same. Mm. And so I think in a nutshell, I would say that feminist economics has to be um, that which looks at everybody's contribution mm. and looks at the contributions that don't currently count as if they as if they should mm. and I think this will become even more acutely important in um, in this age of the robots in this age of artificial intelligence when so much even paid or lower paid work isn't going to be there anymore because you know bank tellers and supermarket checkout workers and 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 actually even even arguably more skilled work than that may not exist in its current form. What is our approach going to be as a society to that? Are we going to experiment with things like basic income? Are we going to, as I hope we will, and I know we will under a Labour government, invest in social infrastructure as well as physical infrastructure? In other words, invest in, in the caring professions mm. and making them count. Um, because they are capable, if properly remunerated and respected, of not just being more gender equal parts of the workforce, but being really rewarding work, um, not just for the recipients of, of, of these services, whether it's teaching or lawyering or therapy or medicine or care more generally, but also really quite rewarding work um, for our young people and older people going forward. Mm -hmm. And I would argue, in the end, still work that is better done by humans than robots. On that subject of, of, of investing in structures and mm. institutions, um, the, the question of health. No. I mean, science is science, isn't it? Why, why do we need a feminist approach to health, per se? Well, I've, I'm gonna, forgive me, I'm just going to read this fantastic, fantastic quote by someone better qualified than me to talk about, about women's health. This was something I discovered on my travels. And, um, and, and a quote from a very eminent medic and man, a very eminent, uh, eminent feminist medical man, um, a gentleman called Professor Mahmoud Fatala. And he said this, after I completed 50 years in the noble profession of women's health, I was once asked, what's the one prescription which I think women need most for their health. My answer was power. Power is what women need to enjoy their right to health. Powerlessness of women, in my professional experience, is a serious health hazard, and in particular in maternal health. But women have to fill that prescription themselves and to keep a sustainable supply of it. No pharmacy will dispense it for them. When asked about the dose, my advice was to take as much as you can get. <laughs> there is no risk of overdosage <laughs> and there are no reported side effects. Um, which I thought was lovely, but, but, but more seriously, I think um, a feminist approach to health um, does require you to think about all the, all the, all the biological and non-biological reasons um, why, why, why women suffer at different stages in life. Um, in, in different respects, and the differential suffering, not just uh, of women, but, but, you know, but of men too, and we discussed briefly earlier, um, you know, depression and suicide rates for, for young men. I think, you know, um, feminists will recognise that and want to address that as well. But also, you know, um, maternal health and the lack of priority that is still given to maternal health, reproductive rights, um, um, uh, another um, wonderful um, encounter I had on my travels to write this book was with a, um, a health activist called Polly Claydon, who said to me, oh, women are actually quite healthy. Um, um, you know, most of the problems, the specific women's health problems, aren't biological per se, and I kind of was bemused mm. by this. And, and, and her, her phrase was, the problem is too often men go first. 
And what she meant by men go first is everything from um, men using the clean needles first in, um, in social uh, drug use to, um, to boy babies in parts of the world being held on the breast longer than girl babies to all the times when women are sacrificing um, their nutrition and their health. Um, and so it goes on. Uh, um, period poverty. Mm. Now, period poverty isn't just about women um, and girls in the developing world who still struggle to have, to have their dignity and their ability to function about once a month for about 40 years of their lives. Um, you know, we, you know, there are examples um, of you know, the, the shameful practice of child paddy that still claims the lives of young girls crawling into huts in Nepal uh, and women um, and girls in, in Cape Town not getting access to, um, to sanitary products and having to improvise with sand and socks and so on. We've got this problem here in the United mm. Kingdom. We've got, you know, we've got girls and women in the United Kingdom who cannot afford sanitary products. In, you know, in this city, in one of the richest cities, in one of the richest countries on earth. And that's all part of this, you know, you know looking at, at, at health through this, through this gendered mm. lens. In your answer there, as elsewhere, I'm, I'm reminded that <clears throat> this is, it, it, it's so global yeah. in reach. Um, and, and it's one of the, the, the pleasures and interests of reading the book that you really do travel all over the world and occasionally to outer space as well. Um, but can we, can we take that global reach to, to your own experience of home, which is both local and global? And you, you have a, a chapter on home. And I just wondered if you could just tell us a little bit about how your home shaped you. Well, I mean, I suppose this might be where, um, where younger, more um, enlightened feminists than I would you know, use um, buzzwords like intersectionality, you know, um, which, are, which are all the rage now, but, but to me, um, conjure ideas of multiple identity. Because the truth is, you know, I am a woman, but I am more than a woman too. And, the, and, and in a sense, the irony of this whole project is that I'm making this argument to you that, um, that gender injustice, in terms of numbers at least, uh, may well be the greatest human rights abuse on the planet, and therefore we have to take some radical, um, possibly, hopefully, time-limited measures, and I explore you mm, know, affirmative action that. and so yeah. on, um, uh, in order to at least kick-start or catalyse change. But at the same time, I don't want to... I don't want to... Um, I don't want to build a barrier between us. I don't want a battle of the sexes. I don't want to build... I, you know, I don't want to... Um, to make the, um, the home so secure from intrusion that we become jailed in our own genders while we're fighting to achieve justice. Mm. So, it's very, so it's very complex. But in terms of, of my home and what shaped me as a child, I'm the daughter of, I'm the daughter of migrants um, to, um, to, to the UK. My parents came in the, in the late 1950s. And I, and I you know, use that term migrant with pride because I'll never forget David Cameron, the former Prime Minister, taunting Jeremy Corbyn once at PMQs because Jeremy and Diane Abbott had been to Calais and the former Conservative Prime Minister said, and you went to Calais to talk to a bunch of migrants. Well, you know, my parents were... Not a bunch of migrants, because it only takes two to, <laughs> to be my parents, you understand, but, um, but, uh, but, you know, <laughs> language like that is very common these days and... Um, I was in the Yarlswood Detention Centre on Friday, again with my friend Diane. There are all these amusing pictures online of us looking like a sort of poor man's Cagney and Lacey as we're mm. about to go into Yarlswood Detention Centre. Abbott but, and Costello, yeah. Well, <laughs> perhaps, perhaps. But, um, but, but that's, import that's important to my experience, that, um, that my parents were um, outsiders who came to, to London um, in the late 1950s, they experienced racism, but equally, my mother had come from, you know, had had a pretty chauvinist father back in India where she came from. She didn't have the opportunities and the freedom that she, um, 
that she granted to me. And I think that's another reason why I'm impatient for change now, as, you know, life is ticking on. I, I, and my mother's not around anymore. I, I, you know, I want, I, I want to do more. And so there was, the, you know, that cultural um, issue about her having um, come, from, come from India with all that that meant. Um, they experienced, you know, some racism in London um, in the 1960s. But on the plus side, on the plus side, they didn't have an extended family around them in London, so they created one um, of their friends who came from all over the world. And London, let's be honest, it's not, London's not perfect, but that is one of the great things about London, that, that you, know, you can be here five minutes and be a London or whatever else you, know, whatever else you are, you can, you can be a London. So they had a home which was not very lavish, that was always full of people and conversation and debate and stories from all over the world. And that has no doubt shaped my view of politics, of human rights, of, um, of, of all of these things, and made me an internationalist, sort of right down, right down to my DNA. Mm. And that sort of, I mean, talking about uh, your mother and, and, and in your last book, and I think possibly here as well, you mentioned how important, I mean, both your parents were, but how formative she was, particularly in terms of your love of reading mm. and, and, and sort of early, uh, early on being taught to read. You talk about education mm. as, as one of the, success, as one of the, as the good news uh, in this book. And, and I'm worried and anxious. Uh, persuade me. I mean, what, why is education, when it seems so dire, it seems that we're dealing with increasing... Uh, decreasing levels of literacy, even here in the UK, um, and, and the enormous problems and gaps that are, that, that, that are still to be addressed and opening up. Why was your finding that education is a good news story? Well, it's the good news because if we keep investing in it, and that's a big if, but you know, you, you know, mm. you know how um, much we cherish it in the Labour Party and what our plans are. Um, I say it's the good news because if you invest in it, you can probably make one of the biggest single differences to, to, to people's lives. So why am I sitting here um, in front of all of you um, as the, the Shadow Attorney General, having you know, had a, a really privileged life and career as the daughter of, of migrants in the late 1950s, essentially because of education, right? And that begins with my mother who, bless her, taught me to read and write before I went to school. And then that continues with the benefits of a great, a great British state education all the way to 22 and my law degree at the LSE down the road with zero tuition fees and a full maintenance grant, a full maintenance grant. Just say that again. <laughs> no, no, it's, no, no, but, but, yeah, I, I, no, but I feel very, very age. strongly about this and I feel mm -hmm. equally ashamed at, you know, some of my generation in politics, I shall be 49 this year, who, don't, who, who benefited as I did, but don't always think that it's appropriate to grant the same benefit to the next generation. I think that education is the, has been the key to, um, to my life in so many ways. And that's me speaking personally. I mean, you know, I left university in the early 90s with virtually no debt. And then I went on to bar school and I had to work and borrow and so on for that. But that was much more attainable given that I hadn't started with tens of thousands of pounds in debt and you know my family was debt averse I'm still debt averse as a lot of as a lot of um, people um, as a lot of people are and I don't think that's always to the always to the bad e either but, but equally if you look at the wider world if you look at um, developed countries or for want of a better word OECD countries in the last century um, they basically moved um, in, in one century to achieving more or less full-time secondary education for all boys and girls in one century in the, in, the, in the developed world, you know, for want of a better term. And it is, you know, the bing, it's the biggest single way, probably, um, and, and tell me if you think I'm wrong, to change the life chances of a woman in, in terms of, yes, uh, you know, work um, and, and political activity, um, but also health, and also the, um, the opportunities of that woman's children. 
because it will have that trickle it will you know education will have that trickle down effect on the woman's life chances and those of those of her children mm -hmm. so if we you know keep investing in education in 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 all parts of the world and really ultimately treating other people's children as we would our own in terms of the priority that we give to education including higher and further and vocational education i think it, you know it it is uh, a hugely a hugely powerful powerful thing mm. um i'd like to uh shortly open up the floor for some discussion uh, and questions which i'm sure um you have so start thinking uh, about those um and while you are um I wanted to, to just ask you just a couple, a couple more things. Um, one of the things that I think uh, distinguishes this book as a book about feminism, which we can now happily say is, if not quite a crowded uh, book market, actually is, is, is at least a market, is a place where there is even 20 or 30 years ago, uh, certainly when I was a student, there was no possibility that I could walk into a bookshop and there would this, be this diverse array. Uh, of books on this subject. But one of the things that distinguishes your book, it seems to me, is that you actually, as well as offering an analysis, uh, you offer a, a, a program, that there's an underlying exploration of what do we do? What, what is the action? Not why, why are we here and what's happened and what's rolled back, but what do we do? And if you can't be bothered to read the book, you can just go to the conclusion and I've tried to... <laughs> it's all there. But so, and, and one way of looking at this book is to, is, is, is to read it um, as as making a very, very interesting analysis and case for affirmative action. Mm. I'm conscious the book was published last o October, so there's been some time in between. And I'd just like to ask you, what has been the response to you making that case for affirmative action amongst both friends and foes? Well, it's been interesting because obviously and predictably, some people are terrified of, um, of positive discrimination in particular and of my suggestion that we should experiment. The time has come to experiment um, uh, with time-limited quotas in certain, in certain um, sectors of the world of work. And uh, my argument for that is that, you know, relatively quickly, I believe you could create a new norm and you wouldn't need them anymore. And by the way, I think they could work in both directions. So, so, for example, there might be lots of, um, there might be, I don't know if there are any teachers in the room, but there might be lots of primary head teachers who think that, um, you know, little boys and little girls could actually benefit from having some more young male teachers in school <coughs> and would be grateful for the opportunity, it's not, it's not really lawful at the moment, but would be grateful for the opportunity to say, right, this autumn we are going to fill all... Um, for new vacancies in this school with young male teachers because we've got, you know, some fatherless families and, and you know, and, and we want these children to see, to, to see young men as well as young women. This is a very feminised profession. It might actually drive up some of the salaries as well, etc., etc. Um, so that's one side of the coin. There might well be, and I know there are, chief constables who would like the opportunity sometimes to be able to go out and recruit um, um, police officers from certain ethnic groups that are underrepresented in the, in, in the police service. And it would make for a better police service because it would automatically be more representative. And remember, our policing tradition in Britain is supposed to be that the police come mm. from the community mm. rather than being some sort of ex external thing. And then equally, and of course I'm, going to, I'm working my way to this, um, you know, there are parts of the workforce that are way, way too unequal in terms of the representation of women. That's both horizontally and vertically. So that's both, we need to get more women into STEM areas and, and certain parts of the workforce, but also um, vertically, you've got lots of um, young women going into the law, my own profession, and that lots of them, probably equal or sometimes a bit more than men at the at the entry level, whether it's at the bar or in law firms, but then we go all the way up to partnership, silk, and into the judiciary, and of course to the senior judiciary. And it's really, in my view, you know, not good enough. And the arguments against some experiment in time-limited positive discrimination 
are, are wearing thin with, with me, at least. And the idea that there's some tension between merit and diversity, I find really difficult. And based on the idea that the status quo in the world is a meritocracy, I don't think it is. I mean, I, I understand that law books are very heavy, so maybe you know, us women need to, need to work out a little more before we, you, you know, you get my, so, so I am arguing for an experiment. Um, and I think in some areas of the workforce, um, it could be open to an employer to make a social or business case for being able to experiment in that way. And in other areas mm. of the workforce, it might be required by statute. As I say, on a time-limited basis, nobody wants quote, quotas forever. Now, some people are obviously shocked and alarmed uh, when you suggest this. Mm. Other people, particularly some young feminists, say, what took you so long, Shami? You know? mm. um, and then another thing, just to, sorry, I'm going on too long, but, but another thing in relation to work and, um, and, and taking more positive, mm. proactive action is that in, in, in relation to equal pay, I don't think we can continue after nearly 50 years of equal pay legislation in this country to rely on individual uh, women themselves to A, find out what everybody else is getting paid and B, put their head above the parapet and try and take legal action against their employer, mm -hmm. particularly when civil legal aid and has been completely obliterated. So I, I think that it's time for, um, for, for, for state actors to audit and enforce equal pay mm -hmm. legislation as they do with tax and other aspects of mm -hmm. corporate governance. Um, one final thing before, before we go to the floor, and I think we've got some roving mics as well, so when I invite you to ask your uh, brief and perfectly formed uh, questions, um, just wait for the mic to come to you, please. Or comments. <laughs> or my favourite, which is the short comment that is, um, that's thinly disguised as a question. Goes up at the end. You, you just uh, I think you're, all, you're wrong for the following reasons. Don't you agree? Um, Another thing that's changed quite dramatically, and I, I see that the, the, and, and in your introduction uh, that, you, that you actually caught the book up with that and, and, and wrote it, was the, uh, with, the, with the Weinstein revelations. Yeah. Uh, and you use that uh, Tom Hanks quote um, as to you know, this being a watershed. Um, what, uh, what difference between, you know, since... I mean, so much of what was already, is in the book, it, it, you can already see that that was there. But what, what difference do you think that makes at this, the hashtag me too, at this moment in time? How, does they, how do things feel different or not since the time when this book was published six months ago? Well, I think that for this moment at least, um, people are more sensitive and sensitised and uh, vigilant. Um, but only time will tell whether we do something about it. Mm. And so I think it's great that people wearing this colour or that colour on the... On, and I'm not, I don't mean to be sarcastic, I really don't. That, you know, sort of red carpet interventions and, and, um, and speeches and particularly raps. Um, and, 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 you know, that's all great, but, but we need to go further. And, 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 and change cultures and sometimes change structures. And, and, and we have to have robust due process in institutions so that, that victims, for want of a better word, can have confidence in, so they actually feel that they can make a complaint in the moment and mm -hmm. it will be handled, um, and it will be handled fairly on both sides. Um, otherwise, it will be a moment, and I, I worry about the moment, you know, fizzling out um, without actually having mm. made long-term progress. Okay, thank you. So, to some questions, and in the interest of affirmative action and the representation of the People Act, I will be taking questions first from women in the audience. <laughs> <laughs> so that will be you. But there is a gentleman who's waving my first book and he gets extra so points for we'll that. So, what we'll do is, can we please just take, we'll take the questions in three, so we'll start with you, and if you can, the rest of you can put your hands up and then I can just pick uh, a couple. And then that lady there, please, and then the gentleman who brought your first book. So yeah, thank you, exactly. in that order, and then, is that all right? And then you no, can whatever answer. You think, yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, no pressure at all on asking the first question. I'm not quite sure it's been formed properly in my head, the question, and I'm not sure the words are going to come right, but in all your research and your book writing and your meeting all these people to, to develop your point of view on what you've just presented, um, have you formed um, an opinion 
in the rule of women for peacekeeping. Hmm. Very good. Okay, thank you. Sorry, the price of um, a, a childcare f f in for um, full time, I think, is something like two hundred or three hundred pounds a week. Thank you. Thank you very much. And maybe a third. And then there's, there's, hold three there's no, this gentleman. I, I, Thank are, we, you. are we there? Oh, we are. Good. are. Hi, uh, John Hislop from Cornwall, and I'm a physician. So I'll give you the positive feedback. In my profession, women are in the majority at uh, junior level now and that's fantastic it's taken uh, 100 years since my medical school was exclusively women and i was let in later uh, my question though is about the internationalist bit of it because we've got the law the law's there it's been there for years and it's being moved on in dem dem democracies but there are others out there so what's your game plan for engaging with others like Saudi Arabia, uh, Greek Orthodox religion, Roman Catholicism, or indeed um, no, I hear you. Mecca. Thank you. Thank so you. Peacekeep women peacekeeping, yeah. childcare Brilliant. provision up to the age of one, uh, and uh, uh, international. So believe it or not, medicine. I do actually touch on all three of these areas in, in, in my in Mary my, Poppins book. In my, it's a Mary Poppins book. There's not, you know. <laughs> There's more in, in it than in it. So, so there's a chapter um, in, um, towards the end of the, uh, of the book called Insecurity. And I look at this idea of, you know, women, are women natural peacekeepers? Well, you know, women have done some great things in relation to peacekeeping. And I tell some of the stories of, of, of the work that they've done in, in Latin America and in Africa and so on. But let's not fall into the trap of saying that we're just inherently peaceful because there are some great women warriors as well that need to be um, that, that need to be um, uh, acknowledged and I, and I do talk about you know um, women from um, you know from Lausanne and and, and um, there were samurai women and you know so, so women have you know been um, been great warriors too but yes I do think there is something to be said about um, the work that women have done whether in Northern Ireland um, whether um, in Rwanda and elsewhere on, on, on building the peace and thinking about other people's children as well as their own. And also when you're building, after a traumatic, after a traumatic moment in, in a region or in a society like a war or a civil war, you really need to have you really need to have everybody round the table of constructing the new, the new settlement. Well, there's a real danger that the new settlement won't be so much better than the old settlement. So, um, well, I'll be interested in what you, th what you think when you, when you read that chapter. But I, I wanted not to fall into the cliched sort of trap of saying, oh, we're just inherently peaceful and, and, and women don't fight and so on, because that's not true. And there are women who've been taking on ISIS, um, as we know, and I talk about some of them in the book too. But yes, I think it essentially an overly segregated society is strange and unnatural and unhealthy. And when you're building something new and positive and hopefully peaceful, I think you need mm. to have everybody, um, including, um, including women, uh, around that table. And then um, uh, childcare, of course. And I should have, in my answer about you know, social infrastructure, I mean, that I, should have been, I should have said more. And yes, I do think we should be, we should be aiming towards universal uh, childcare. When I think about... Uh, I, my son's nearly 16 now, but when I think about the early years, I, um, early years, I was, I was um, a lawyer at Liberty and then director of Liberty, spending, you know, sometimes the bulk of my, of my, um, of my earnings on, on, on childcare. And then I also think about, in the chapter on home, mm. um, I, one of the pleasures was to look back at some great feminist literature from, from previous um, 
ages and, and decades and previous learning and wisdom. And, you know, it's worth going back to Jermaine Greer's uh, 90 female eunuch and her, and her observations on the atomization. So, so, so universal childcare or greater childcare is not just about making it possible for women to go out to work and be good little workers too. It's also about social infrastructure. It's also about not being lo lonely and trapped in a little hutch uh, as, a, as a young woman with her, her children. Mm. It's also about, about community and, and looking. And now, of course, we've got an aging population and we should be thinking um, about attempting to move away from atomization, both in terms of care, whether it's older care and childcare, but also in terms of, uh, of community and ways of, uh, ways of living, I think. Um, but, but yes, you're, you're, you're so right. We must invest more in affordable or free childcare. And, and not and not all privatised, absolutely. And Charlie, for the time we have left, the last question will yeah. be about, really importantly, about well, healthcare. Um, well, it's very good to hear about, you know, to, to hear your experience about, about people entering. But, but your question was about um, engaging with the wider world, because I say that this has got to be a global project. And I think um, that just as this has to be social and economic and cultural, as well as civil and political, it has to be interwoven into your policy on development, on foreign affairs, and so on. And I can tell you that, uh, you know, and again, I'll get a little party political here because I'm, I can promise you that the ambition of a Jeremy Corbyn government with Emily Thornberry as Foreign Secretary and Kate Ossimore as, um, as I hope, Development Secretary will be that human rights, including women's rights, will be um, at the table for discussion in re alongside every trade discussion and every aid discussion and every other discussion that we have with our friends because you have to be critical friends in all of this and you cannot always sacrifice human rights and, and women's rights for for other pressing other pressing needs charlie thank you that that's a, a really sort of encouraging and rousing moments to uh, uh, on, on which to finish and to thank all of you and everybody who joined us uh, online as well uh, for being here for this, this fantastic introduction uh, and conversation about your book of women. And there will be a book signing, uh, for those who are here physically, uh, there will be a book signing in the foyer afterwards. So I urge you, if you can, if you haven't already got your copies, to, to come you. and buy one and Shami will sign it. Or if you have, like this gentleman here, brought one, I can see he's already got his pen ready to have it signed. <laughs> Um, but it just remains to me and, and, and indeed to you to thank you for, for being here at the RSA today, both here and online, but primarily to thank you, Shami Chakravarti, well, thank you. and congratulations on your book on women. Thank you.